presentation of this Viewfinder episode is locally supported by UC Davis Health System. This is the emerging new profile of today's children. I was just bored and so I just snack and snack and snacked until eventually I just came overweight. I gained 20 pounds over the summer. And a new word is becoming part of their vocabulary. Diabetes. Diabetes. I'm at risk for diabetes because I'm at risk of getting diabetes. This is a disease which is supposed to happen in older people. My age, if ever. Childhood obesity. How did we get here? We're in the midst of a, a public health disaster. Can we reverse the tide before it's too late? We could, for the first time, have a generation of young people who die sooner uh, than their parents. Hello, I'm Emerald Ye. We've all heard the term childhood obesity. We've all heard the statistic. One in four children overweight or obese, triple what it was just 30 years ago. And we all know the answer, better diet and more exercise. But following that prescription is another matter because with all the media attention and public awareness about this, our children are still gaining weight. Many are even getting sick. In California, childhood obesity is worsening with 30% of Central Valley children being overweight. So what's going on? Is it just lack of discipline? Or have we focused too much on individual behavior and not enough on our children's surrounding environment? Tonight, we visit schools, doctors, nutritionists, public health experts, and a local convenience store in search of answers. Hey. Kyle Kamen and his parents are at a special clinic for children with diseases and problems related to being overweight. At the age of nine, Kyle weighs 140 pounds. He's tall for his age at 5'2", but still a healthy weight for him is 80 to 102 pounds. For me, it was like, my son doesn't have a weight issue. Um, coming here and learning that yes, he does, has opened me up to realize that if we don't take care of it now, it could be dangerous for him down the road. Dr. Dennis Stein started this clinic at UC Davis Medical Center in 1999 with funding from the Rumsey Indian Tribe. It is open to all children who are severely overweight and has a long waiting list. I now have patients as young as eight to six years of age with adult diabetes. We're seeing fatty liver disease in children along with these other complications. So we have children, young children, with diseases of effectively middle-aged people. An astounding one in three children born in the year 2000 is expected to develop diabetes, with overweight children also at higher risk for cancer, heart disease, stroke, asthma, and sleep apnea. Dr. Stein cautions that childhood obesity should not be viewed as something a child can simply grow out of. If you were obese as a child, no matter what your weight is as an adult, you have a twofold increased incidence of death by any cause. He gets apples and yogurt. Kyle and his family have been following the diet and exercise regimen prescribed by Dr. Stein's clinic for three months. Instead of snacking on cookies, chips, and leftovers from dinner, he now has yogurt, crackers, and fruit. I just knew that I was gonna have to lose weight. For a child to lose weight, the family has to support the new routine. Kyle's mother's assignment was to restock the house with healthier foods. It's mom's job to make sure the food is there and that she's controlling the food environment in the house. It's a whole family change. It's not just him. It's, the, it's everybody, not just our base family. It's you know, in-laws and, and grandparents and great-grandparents. Everybody has to be on board with this. <laughs> The family eats out only once a week now, since restaurant food often has more fat, salt, and sugar than what's cooked at home. They eat smaller portions, and Kyle doesn't drink sodas anymore. Children who drink four sodas a day, and many do, not this boy, but many do, can gain 90 pounds over one year's time if nothing else is altered. He's also cut out something else. Gatorade. Well, <laughs> they always talk about how that's good for sports, but. Most people don't need that, and it's got a lot of sugar in it. So water is the best idea for sports. Nutritionists and doctors also warn that juices, even pure fruit juices, are high in calories and suggest no more than one cup a day. Children are better off eating the fruit itself. What's been hardest for Kyle, though, is the 30-minute rule at dinner, where he has to wait half an hour after eating before getting seconds. Some reading stuff on tonight. Read. 
Did you get a book tonight? Yeah. I usually buy the 30 minutes. He's not hungry. Cartoon Network. Kyle is also watching less TV and getting more exercise. Cuz I really needed to get more active. It's like carrots and cake. You take the carrots and you leave the cake alone sometimes. Three months after his first visit, Kyle has grown an inch in height, but his weight has stayed the same. And for Kyle, not gaining is success because at his age, Dr. Stein says Kyle still has years to grow and can therefore grow into his weight. Kyle, unfortunately, is one of the rather few success stories you can see so obviously. We do a lot of work with a lot of people, but as soon as the people leave our, leave our office, they're back in America 2005. Part of that outside world is the school lunch, one of the front lines in the battle to restore good eating habits to our children. School lunches can be balanced and nutritious, but some are so fattening that pediatricians tell children to bring lunch from home. If we want to buy lunch here, we have to have pizza, we chicken patty on a bun, and it's all packaged food, so it's not like it's fresh or anything. But here and there, school lunches are getting an extreme makeover. Fresh salad bars with fruits and vegetables from local farmers five days a week. That's what the Davis Unified School District started in all its elementary schools, tripling its expenditures for fresh produce. And we were, we were showing that kids were taking over the USDA requirement of fruits and vegetables. Dr. Gail Feenstra of UC Davis helped launch the Farm to School program at Davis Elementary Schools and is now doing a survey to see how much of those fruits and vegetables the children actually eat and how much they throw away. And the cucumbers came from our local farmer. The carrots were from our Also concerned about what the kids are eating is Rafaelita Curva, the school district's food services director, who works with an incredibly limited budget, $2.50 in government reimbursements per meal, which also covers her labor, administrative, and transportation costs. That leaves her $1 per meal for food. On top of that, providing open salad bars requires extra labor and leaves a fair amount of waste each day. It was, it was a very difficult struggle, and my budget had suffered. We had in, uh, incurred um, losses. So four years after the experiment began, the open salad bar has been shelved. The school district is trying something else, salads that are packaged in the central kitchen, still made fresh every day, but now with control over portion size and variety. It is a more balanced salad, and it does, it does help in teaching them better choices and how it should look. But going from open salad bar to packaged salads takes adjustment. Because they had fresh fruit last year in the bar, and that, I think that was better. And now everything's packaged. What's wrong with packaged? Well, packaged just doesn't, doesn't taste fresh. And there's something else about the way children like their fresh vegetables. Small children don't like their foods to touch. If they had carrots, they would eat, they would choose the carrots and they would eat the carrots. But when you put carrots, cucumbers, lettuce, and other things on top of each other, they choose not to take it. In a way, the farm to school program in Davis can be viewed as a giant leap forward and now a small step back, but still part of an evolving process. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. We can't expect to see farm to school programs in every school in the next couple of years. It's taken a long time for our food system to develop to the way it is, where we have a very concentrated, industrialized food system that produces cheap food, prepackaged food, convenience food for the whole nation, including the school lunch programs. But the salad bar did do something very important. It sparked the children's interest in fruits and vegetables. If kids get a foundation of eating good quality foods and a variety of those, at an early age, they're going to carry those into their later life. In high schools, though, where students have more purchasing freedom, school lunch is almost no match for what's called competitive foods, and a government report shows that almost every high school has this. Foods and beverages unregulated in nutritional content that are sold in campus snack bars, vending machines, and even cafeterias. 
Um, I just bought a Pepsi. Uh -huh. Is that your lunch? <laughs> yes. Are you eating anything else? Uh, no, that's it. <laughs> I just bought a frosting and I bought um, a three musketeers and some chocolate donuts. Is that your lunch? Yes, it's, nor it's my normal lunch usually. Recent national studies show that only 1% of adolescents is meeting the dietary recommendations of the food guide pyramid. For teenagers, convenience is often more important than nutrition. Do you like healthier foods or do you prefer this? I, I like healthier foods and then just this is faster. But drinking sodas and other sugary drinks instead of milk has an irreversible consequence. Teenage girls lay down the majority of their bone strength by the time they're 14 or 15 years of age and boys by the time they're roughly 17 years of age. The rest of your life you can maintain it, you can stop it if you're lucky from going away but you'll never be able to build it up again. Teenage girls and teenage boys who are drinking soda without calcium content are robbing themselves of the future health of their bones. For the last many years, far too many schools have become soda and junk food superstores. And far too often, schools have claimed that they need that money for absolutely important projects on campus. Schools need to raise funds that don't have a negative impact, a horribly negative impact on our children's health. In the Folsom Cordova Unified School District, school lunches are meeting the challenge head on. Al Scheider came from the private sector 10 years ago to run the school lunch program. He made changes that could have sparked a student revolt. We don't sell soda, we don't sell cookies, we don't sell any a la carte food item. Hamburger? No hamburger, no french fries. Instead, he turned the cafeterias into food courts, offering 10 items daily, like freshly made pasta, salads, sandwiches, sushi, and teriyaki bowls with vegetables. Everyone pays $2.50, and each meal comes with fresh fruit and milk, plus water. Student participation in the lunch program doubled, and lunch sales went from $1.7 to $4 million a year. The milk sales alone are impressive. Only 50 high school students used to buy milk. Today, 700 drink milk for lunch. I'm just the food service guy and I can do it. If I can do it, many, many people can do it. Other school officials, state lawmakers, and even a BBC film crew have paid visits to see how Al does it. Some 60 schools have incorporated his ideas. But even Al Scheider's lunches have to compete with soda vending machines and a snack bar just outside the cafeteria. Nutrition is conducive to a learning environment. Snack foods are counterproductive to that environment. They have behavioral problems in the classroom. They have kids who are falling asleep in the classroom. I mean, we can't connect the dots here. Lawmakers have taken notice. New laws banning soda and junk food sales in all California public schools will be going into effect, but not for at least another two years. Until then, the snack bars remain open for business. A couple of your blood tests were a little abnormal. Cindy is 16 years old and 36 pounds overweight. She gained much of it this summer. I wasn't even eating food at all. I was just eating chips and sodas. Like, no regular food? No. <laughs> Why is that? Because my mom wasn't home. She was in Mexico. <laughs> so, and I missed her. <laughs> Doctors like Nancy Torres at Kaiser's say it's important to treat a child's weight problem psychologically as well as medically. They come in with issues of low self-esteem, feeling depressed. I mean, that's how, how they relate to their being overweight and obese. Some doctors avoid the words overweight and obese when talking to their young patients. Instead, they talk about the goal of getting to a healthy weight. Much easier for them to feel comfortable with making change if they look at it from a healthy standpoint as opposed to something that sounds bad. Your weight has gone down one pound. So that's very good. Dr. Torres sees hundreds of patients, but can count on two hands the number who have successfully lost weight long term. And it's usually the adolescent patient because they've decided to take the responsibility. They've decided they want to change their, those behaviors. Walking every morning. 30 minutes. Good. And I've been trying to, you know, staying away from soda and juice and drinking 36 ounces of water each day. I think you're doing great. These days, the medical profession is making a shift to prevent as well as treat childhood obesity. 
Kaiser pediatricians routinely do body mass index or BMI calculations on all their patients to assess their risk of being overweight. Straight up, put your feet back and look straight ahead, just like a little soldier boy. There we go. And Doctors then... measure the children's height and weight to calculate their BMI, which is a measurement of body fat. Parents can easily get their children's BMI by doing a web search for children BMI calculator and then plugging in their child's height, weight, gender, and age. It's a way of addressing the issue with a number. And it's easy to understand a number. When people say, what's your vision? You have a number. <laughs> so to have that number allows uh, a frame of reference for making a discussion. And we look at the body mass index, and it's 16. He's doing great, yeah. For children and teens with very high BMIs and at risk of diabetes, Kaiser offers an eight-week program called High Five, which provides kids with tools and incentives to make lifestyle changes. This week I'm working on eat more vegetables, play more, and limit sugary drinks, and don't skip any meals. Many children show improvements in their cholesterol levels, blood pressure, and insulin resistance after eight weeks. What else can I have? Like the UC Davis program, Kaiser requires parents to participate in the weekly class, and the kids like that. Because then I feel the, um, like the weight of the world is on my shoulders, and when they help me out, it feels like the pressure is lifting off. Spencer's father makes it a priority to come, even though he travels for his job. I've done a few red eyes and a few other things in order to make sure I've been here on, on Mondays, and, and, and part of that is just so that he knows that it's not just him by itself. We're not driving by and dropping him off and, well, this is his issue to deal with. It's, no, we're all in this together. I'm going to put my stethoscope right there and we're going to give your arm a little hug. The statistical odds of getting diabetes are cruelest to ethnic minorities, especially Hispanics and African Americans. Half their kindergartners today are expected to get diabetes. For Native Americans, the chances are even higher. While these groups are more genetically prone to diabetes and obesity, the American diet and lifestyle make things worse. Genetics loads the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. As in the auto safety and anti-smoking campaigns, public health advocates say it will take a broad-based, aggressive, and sustained effort to effectively deal with childhood obesity. At one time, we would say to the government, don't tell me to wear a seatbelt. Now we're just used to it. And that saves literally tens of thousands of lives every year in the United States. It's time, it's critical that policymakers, that community leaders take their responsibility to establish those kinds of policies that support parents in making healthy choices. I, I see the... Um the obesity crisis as being a wake-up call to Americans to rethink the way the food industry uh, operates in the United States. But public education campaigns are outgunned a thousand times to one by the advertising dollars of the food and beverage industry. More than half the TV ads aimed at kids push high-calorie sweets, snacks, and drinks, and children watch an average of 40,000 TV commercials a year. All the while, the advertisers claim this is all about personal responsibility. Well, bunk, this is really about not only personal responsibility, but very effective marketing developed by highly paid, highly trained um, professionals whose job it is to try to undermine parents' messages about healthy eating and physical activity. Some health advocates want restrictions, even a ban on advertising to children under the age of 12. And that's already been done in Sweden, not just for food advertising, but for, for all sorts of advertising. Um, the United Kingdom is considering a similar ban. There is a simple, more immediate answer to this part of the problem. Turn off the TV. We know that the more television you watch, statistically, you tend to be heavier. That's proven in adults, it's proven in children. Many, many national studies have shown this. But unhealthy foods are marketed in ways beyond television, through in-school promotions, product placement in stores, and coupons. A Chicago study found fast food restaurants within a few minutes' walk from almost every school in the city. We have 
quite literally created a toxic food environment, an environment that encourages and seduces our children to make unhealthy eating and activity choices. Part of that environment is also our car-oriented lifestyle, with less P.E. in schools, more computer time, fewer sidewalks to walk on, and less time to cook. Hi, how are you? So we buy cheap, fast food. There's something wrong with the way our lives are set up to encourage unhealthy food choices everywhere we go. Dr. Harold Goldstein of the Center for Public Health Advocacy feels this cartoon is only a slight exaggeration of how our food environment prods us to eat empty, fattening foods. Rather than these being weapons of mass destruction, these are really the weapons of mass expansion, and they're working, and we found them. This is what's known as a food desert, a low-income neighborhood where supermarkets with fresh, healthy food are often out of reach. The mainstay instead is a convenience store with stockpiles of candies, chips, and sodas. Hey, you, want some chips? you might have a mother with two or three kids who knows that she needs to serve a few vegetables with dinner and wants to serve low-fat milk but has to take two buses to get to the supermarket to get that. But at Jimmy's Corner Store in North Sacramento, something new, a row of fresh produce for sale. Ker Wu is the owner. Cabbage, lettuce, uh, Chinese mustard green, color green, apple, banana. This corner store experiment is one attempt to change the food environment. The project is run by UC Davis social marketing professor, Dr. Diana Cassidy. She pulled together $25,000 in grants to give Wu's store a jump start with a refrigerator case, a fresh paint job, and a consultant to help make the change. So the whole purpose is to make these look as pretty as possible so that like you would like to buy it, so I would like to buy it. Nathan Cheng has helped convert six other convenience stores in Northern California. It's not an easy undertaking and has its risks. It's a very difficult item to sell because it's not something that is easily replaced or it doesn't have a shelf life, so it has to be sold quickly. So it's, it's a risk. Nathan says local stores can start slowly, even with just a box of oranges. So is this a good change? It's a good change. Why is that? Well, okay, you guys, because I can come in here and I can get my fruit, my vegetables, instead of going to the big grocery store. I can come right here and get it. Dr. Cassidy will track sales over the next year to see if selling produce is helping rather than hurting Wu's bottom line. So if we can prove that this works, possibly other stores can make the same changes and we'll really make it possible for kids and their families to make healthier choices and to maintain their weight. The home kitchen, the last stronghold in today's sea of convenience and junk foods. You can be in charge of what you eat and you know you can take charge of your diet. You can make decisions about what you're going to prepare for your family. But in this day of time-strapped, budget-crunched families, making healthy dinners at home is difficult. Sheila Murray has four children. When you are busy, um, it's like you have to go the extra mile to do the right thing. 67 cents, we'd get three pounds for our money, right? So Under a statewide University of California extension program, thousands of families, most on food stamps, are discovering ways to make meals that are quick, affordable, and healthy. They also learn about portion sizes. I want you to take your plate and I want you to fold it in half. Okay? The lessons are visual, hands-on, and easy to remember. So I'm gonna have a little bit of protein up in the quarter, and a little bit of whole grains in the other quarter, and half vegetables. I was surprised because we've, in, in our house, we have the veggies and the protein switched because Growing up, that's how it was in the TV dinner, so we have. <laughs> These families also learn that planning ahead is the key. I found that it was not time consuming at all. Simple, quick, easy. My daughter, who is 12, she could have did that by herself. And so it's time to stop making excuses and get the job done. Getting children to eat healthier is a daily challenge for any family, let alone society. But with more awareness of how environment also affects children's food choices and their future health, one place to start is at home. Families tend to be healthier if they make their meals and they eat together. It's, it's more than just nutrition. Food 
is warmth, it's pleasure, it's love, and it's, it's good for the family. Thank you for joining us. We've seen what a serious problem childhood obesity is. We hope you've learned some ways it can be tackled in the family and in our environment. I'm Emerald Ye. Good night. Presentation of this Viewfinder episode is locally supported by UC Davis Health System. It's truly, honestly heartbreaking to hear these statistics and to see what's happening to our children because I see it day in and day out. It's impossible that we've undergone a genetic change so dramatic in the last 30 years. It's really the environment that has changed. The answer to this epidemic is when all of us take responsibility for that, those aspects of the epidemic that we have some control over. To order a DVD copy of this program, call 888-814-3923 or visit kvie.org viewfinder.